Turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians. Oh, let's go to Romans 12 first. I heard, a, I heard somebody over here say, oh, they're already, already thinking he, two scriptures, we're done. It's toast. A sweet grandmother phoned the hospital, and she asked, is it, so, is it possible to speak to somebody who can tell me how a patient is doing? And uh, this is back before all the HIPAA laws. And so they transferred her and said, I'll be glad to help. And the grandmother said, well, I'm looking to find out how Norma Finley in room 302 is doing. And so a few minutes later, they, they returned on the phone and said, well, here we go. Uh, uh, Norma is doing very well. Her blood pressure is fine. Her blood work is normal. And her physician, Dr. Cohen, has scheduled her to be discharged on Tuesday. The grandmother said, thank you. That's wonderful. I was so worried. God bless you for the good news. And the lady on the phone said, well, you're more than welcome. Is Norma your daughter? And the grandmother said, no, I'm Norma Finley in room 302. Nobody tells me anything in here. <laughs> I've been to some hospitals and done some hospital visits, and it's about like that, too. I mean, my goodness gracious. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I just That is an excellent verse to meditate on. That's not our key verse tonight, but that's just one I wanted to get in there and keep that one in the back of your mind. I really want to get you to 2 Corinthians 3.18 tonight. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. And go ahead and turn in your Bible there. Get your pen out, your highlighter out. Get you a Bible you can write in, or if you have a phone Bible, you know, you can, there's, you can take notes in your phone Bible. You just press on the text and highlight it and type your notes in, and it saves you, saves it for you. Until your phone falls in the lake. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 3, verse 18. It says, but we all. So if they're talking about all, that means us too. With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I woke up with this verse inside me today, and I have not been able to let this verse go. I've been meditating on this verse all day long. And there's times I like to read a lot of quantity in my Bible. I like to read 10, 20 chapters. But every now and then, I just get stuck on a single verse, and I can't get off of it. And this is a verse I can't get off of, and I wanted to share it with you tonight. And so let's just break this down. We're going to break it down in about five different parts. Now, but we all is not one of those parts, but we're talking to you. We all. This is the Corinthian church. So as Paul was talking to them, he's trying to get them to understand that they ought not to be living like the world, and they need to be coming out of side of their old ways, and, and, and they need to separate themselves and live like the born-again person they say they are. And then it says, with unveiled face. Why? What, what, is it? what are we talking about? See, with an unveiled face. See, if you're reading this in your devotions, you know, you're going through your Bible, and you're reading 2 Corinthians 3.18, you're just reading, you know, I'm going to read three chapters today, and I get to chapter 3, here I go, blah, 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 blah. Most of the time, we're going to miss what that means, unveiled faith. What, what does having an unveiled faith, because I'm looking around, I don't see anybody wearing a veil tonight. I, I, I don't see anybody wearing a veil. So uh, what, what's this have to do with anything? And maybe... Maybe, I don't know, maybe you want somebody to wear a veil, but I don't, I don't know. We don't need to wear a veil. But why in the Bible does it bring out here with unveiled face, 
beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. In the Old Testament, <laughs> the veil, uh, two, two references to the veil. And first of all, in the Old Testament worship system that God gave to Moses, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the very holiest presence of Almighty God, was placed in the inner room of the tabernacle worship system. And only a high priest was allowed to go into that room one time per year. And there was a giant curtain called a veil that separated that holy of holies places, a place from the rest of the tabernacle. And the veil was what kept people out. And under that Old Testament system, because they were not cleansed with the blood of Jesus, but they had the blood of bulls, goats, lambs as their atonement, they were not able to be in direct contact with God. And so when it says, with an unveiled face, you see, when Jesus died on the cross and that earthquake hit and the thunder began to crash, do you remember what happened after he said, it is finished, and he hung his head? The veil in the temple was torn into. Mm. And... uh, We are beholding, and we're going to see what are we beholding, the glory of the Lord, but with an unveiled face. There's nothing keeping you and me from seeing the glory of the Lord. Wow. Wow. And the other reference in that Old Testament system was when Moses was having this awesome prayer time, and he's having this awesome God encounter, and it's just Moses and God. Nobody else went along. And Moses is just, I mean, his, his best friend is God. He says, God, I really, really want to see you. God said, you, you can't even look at, you can't look at me directly, you'll die. But I'll show you my hinder parts. And they put him in the cleft of a rock, and God passed by, and there, there's a whole different message in that. But Moses got to see the backside of God. And when Moses came off that mountain, the Bible tells us his face was shining with the glory of God to the point where people could not look at him. And Moses had to put a veil over his face so that people could look at him and be able to have conversation and come into proximity with him. But you see, when we're purified by the blood of Jesus Christ, we don't have a veil that separates us from the presence of God. And we don't have to have a veil that causes us to dim down what we can see of God. So as, as we're partaking tonight, you, and, and we're gonna, as, as we, we're setting this up, we're doing this with an unveiled face. It's unfiltered. It's, it's the whole thing. It's everything. And it says, beholding as in a mirror. Now, can I have the, the big mirror there, Andrea? You mind? I have my special. So, do you want to see something awesome, Andrea? There we go. Uh, beholding as in a mirror. So, when we look in a mirror, what do we see? Ourself, right? Okay. So, we have an unveiled face. There's nothing filtering what we see. Now, I think in this day of social media, filter has a whole different mentality, doesn't, doesn't it, to the young people? 
Old people, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but young people do. But there's no filters. And we behold in a mirror. Now, what are you supposed to see when you look in a mirror? Yourself. But now there's no veil. There's nothing shielding you from what you're seeing. There's no filter. But as you look in the mirror, what does the Bible tell us we're supposed to be seeing? The glory of the Lord. When, when we look into this mirror, we, now I know when we're getting ready to go out for the morning or whatnot, I mean, I know we all have our routines and that type of thing and, you know, makeup and eyes and trimming things and pulling things and all that stuff. <laughs> Young people popping things. You know, everybody has their things they got to do, right? But you're looking in the mirror and you're, you're you know, when you're, when you're trying to get ready, you're looking at what's wrong. And, and is there a hair out of place? And, and is, is the makeup on correctly? And, and we're trying to take this flesh and make it look better than it does. But from a spiritual mindset, from a spiritual mindset. When we look into the mirror, God's not interested as much in if our eyebrows are perfectly trimmed or our hair needs another application of special shampoo. But God wants us to see his glory when we look at ourselves. We're a reflection of the glory of God. What is the glory? I think the Greek word on glory is kabod. And it means this overwhelming presence of God. And when we are looking at ourselves, and I'm not talking in a mirror, and I'm not talking about for makeup purposes, but when we're doing self-reflection, are we, are we focused on our flesh, on all the things we do wrong, on all of our sins and shortcomings? Because if that's what we see, that's what we're going to focus on. But if we'll learn, we are beholding in a mirror, we are seeing ourselves as a reflection, not just of Jesus. I mean, that would be awesome, just a reflection. But it's not just Jesus. It's the glory. Wow. Wait a second. Wait a second. Vonda, can I pick on you for a second? How old are you these days? 85. 80. You're 80. 89. Now, Vonda, when, do you ever, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, do you ever look at pictures when you were like 16 and 17 and be like, oh, man, that girl was hot? I look at them, but I don't think that. You don't think that. <laughs> All right. Have you ever felt like, I mean, how, how was this? Was it? A aging, you know, you're a, you've aged beautifully. Thank you. You've aged beautifully. <laughs> but some would say that, you know, when we're 21 or 22, that's when we look our best. Or the bride on her wedding day, those type of things. This ain't your wedding day. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not picking. I'm not putting you down. Are you all right with that? <laughs> I should have known better to pick on Sassy back here, <laughs> Sassy Vonda. But when we look in a mirror, if we've aged a little bit, we'll see wrinkles. We'll see hairs that aren't perfect. We'll see, you know, you, you know, like for guys, your nose never stops growing. Your ears never stop growing. Isn't that a terrible thing? That ain't right. Sometimes you wish people would look in the mirror at least and find the nose hairs. You know, trim those out, will you? 
But we're, we're, from a spiritual perspective, we're not just focused on that, the wrinkles and whether we like our nose or our lips or we need Botox or not. I, I don't understand the concept of Botox. And I, I mean, if you've had Botox, I don't care. I love you. I, I just don't understand it. I mean, I mean have you ever, I, I, you can tell sometimes when people have Botox because their lips can't move. So, <laughs> I'm having a great day. How do you like my lips? You know, and they can't move. And have you noticed you kind of need your lips to talk? And when, you're, when, you're, when your lips are bigger than your nose and your eyes combined, maybe you've had a little much. <laughs> Just saying. Just a thought. <laughs> but when we're looking in that mirror, we're supposed to be seeing the glory of God. You, and, 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 and I just think about this another second think about this we're not just supposed to be seeing the image of Jesus we're seeing the glory of Jesus I mean you know we've seen pictures of Jesus okay but how many of y'all know there, there's been times we've been having praise and worship and you can feel the very presence of Jesus you're like oh man that's good and then there's times you see a picture of Jesus and it's a, it's a nice picture of Jesus that's nice, but the, it's nice ain't the same as, oh, that's good, right? And, and when we see, we're looking in that mirror, you're not just seeing a picture of Jesus. You're saying, oh, that's the glory of God right there. Now, some of you men, you're already pretty egotistic, so m maybe we got to temper this a little bit with humility. You know, I, I've met guys and, and families who said, you know, there, I, I've met men that every day they wake up and they say, oh my goodness, I did it again. And they said, what? I got better looking today. Well, but, but you know what? In the spiritual realm, what do you see? Whoa! That's Jesus. And it's not just a picture of Jesus. That's the glory of Jesus right there. And I know we, we wake up on the wrong side of bed sometimes. I know we're just limited human beings with all of our issues. But, man, that, that's how he sees us. <coughs> and we're being transformed into the same image. That's what God wants us to become. So when... People get around you, they just don't see you like, whoa, man, there's something about that guy. And they may not know what it is, but you're a walking carrier of the glory of God. You're a walking reflection of the glory of God. That, and, 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 you know, you've heard the, the, the idea about the sun and the moon. The moon doesn't produce any light of its own. It just reflects the sun. And guess what? Jesus is the sun, you the moon. And we want to be reflecting his light, his glory. Not just a picture, oh, they're a Christian. I, I don't want someone to say that, you know, just, I, I'm glad when they say that I'm a Christian, but I don't want them to say, oh, they're just one of them Christians. I don't want to be one of them Christians. I want to be, man, that person is on fire for Jesus. Have you ever been around that person? They'll change your life. I want to be the person that when I'm around you, you feel like a million dollars. Amen. You know, everybody makes you happy. Some when they come into a room, some when they leave the room. I want to be the one that makes them happy when you come into the room, praise God. A reflection of the glory of Jesus being transformed. Of course, that word transform, we know we've studied that many times. That, that means the process, not, not just changing a little bit, but the complete metamorphosis process. It's the same Greek word that they get the word metaphor, metamorphosis from. It's used for that word transform there. And the indication is it's a butterfly. It's a cocoon that becomes a butterfly or a caterpillar. That the old is not recognizable. The new is nothing like the old. 
and we're being transformed into the image of God, so they don't even know that you used to be a caterpillar, now you're a butterfly. They didn't know you used to be a Shelby or a Cheryl or a Kim. All they know is they've been with Jesus. I feel the glory of God around this person. And they might be a sinner. Have you noticed that sometimes sinners treat you differently? And sometimes they get mad at you. Sometimes they try to respect you. But bottom line is when people know you're for the glory of God, they're not going to be the same because it causes and invokes a response. So we're being transformed, not in the physical appearance, but in the spiritual man, from glory to glory. From glory to glory. There are levels of glory. You know, uh, back in the day, we used to play video games. I don't know if you've ever played video games before. Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Knockout Joe or Glass Joe, whatever his name was. And then now they play all sorts of video games. But these video games that we used to play had levels. And if you were the Pac-Man and you ate all the dots before the ghosts killed you, you got to go to level two. And if you got all the dots in level two before the ghosts ate you, you got to go to level three. And the idea was to get to as many levels as you could. But you know in the kingdom of God, there are levels of glory. And, And this is where I think Christians miss it. I think sometimes, you know, we we get saved, we get the, you know, we get in church, we start getting under the word, and we start dealing with the junk in our lives, and then life gets a lot better because the born again Christian life is the best life, and and we get to the place where okay, it's working. My, you know, I, my bills are paid, my wife loves me, my husband loves me, whatever. Uh, my, my dogs are acting halfway decent. Uh, I have a reasonable amount of joy. I mean, life is good. And what the trap is for a lot of born-again people is we forget that there is another glory available. And then what happens sometimes is Christians get bored. Or Christians get stagnant. We call it, they plateau. They were going, 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 going up, 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 up. And then they get to a place where like, okay, we're, we're, we're comfortable. And then we just kind of go flat for a while. And I'm not against having a plateau every now and then. That's going to happen. That's part of the Christian life. But there is another glory available. Well, how do you get to the next glory? The same way you got to the glory you're in, you're in now. But I'll tell you this, you go to new levels, you're going to fight new devils. New levels, new devils. You want to go to the next glory, be prepared to fight some bigger devils. That's part of it. But you're going to find out who lives on the inside of you. There's not a devil in hell that can resist and, 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 and that does not have to succumb to the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I, I reminded that river that spoke of in the book of Ezekiel, and it was uh, uh, a it was showing him the river of life, and he said, "Go out a thousand cubits, so many feet." We would say. He said, "The water's ankle deep. Go out another thousand cubits. Well, it's knee deep water. Go out another thousand cubits. It's up to my waist." And after a while, they were in the water that was over their head, and. I want to swim in the glory of God that's over my head. I don't want to be content playing in the kiddie pool of the kingdom of God and the river of life. Amen. You see, there are new levels. You do have to keep going a little further. You do have to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And I don't know if you've ever been to the beach. I don't know if you've ever been to a pool. But, you know, when you're, when you're walking in ankle-deep water, it doesn't take much effort. But, man, when you start getting in waist-deep water and you're walking, it, it takes a whole lot. You've you got a, a, a little more effort to get there. And then when you get out over your head, you got to swim. Swimming, swimming takes a lot of energy. What do you mean by that, Pastor Matt? What I mean by that is it takes some effort to get there, praise God. 
But there are new levels. You, you don't have to ever come to church and be bored. You don't ever have to be bored in your faith. You don't ever have to plateau. You don't ever have to just get to a place where your status quo, you've had the same faith for the last 20 years, and, it, and you're just occupying until he comes. Now, if that's what you want to do, praise God, but just know there's another glory available to you. There's another level available to you. And, 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 and man, I don't know about you, but when I look at this thing, I don't want to be like, oh, there's the same old image of Jesus I've always had. I want to be like, whoa, there's a glory, there's another glory. I didn't know there was another, I mean, look at that. That's, a, that's another glory than what I had before. Amen. Can you imagine getting another revelation of Jesus? Get, getting a deeper awareness of his presence? I mean, becoming just more aware of the people around you and having a greater precision for your ministry accuracy. Just walking down the street and you're caught up in the glory and you see somebody and the Lord just speaks, you know, and you just don't go right over there and just, just begin to talk and the Lord just begins to minister through you to that person. That's a glory. Or you get a call and it's all bad news and instead of getting all upset and pouting and, and moaning, you're just like, oh, okay. Well, you mean you're not upset? Well, not real, no. Well, everybody else would be upset. Yeah, but I know who I am. Amen. And maybe my flesh used to act that way, but I'm in the glory of God. I'm a reflection of the glory of Jesus. I don't have to get like that. Amen. And uh, lastly, by the Spirit of the Lord, it says, we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You're not going to just willpower it. You're not just going to willpower coming into the next glory. We can't just self-help you into the next glory. We can't just become one with, you know, the universe into the next glory. There, 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 this isn't just three steps to the next glory. We're transformed into that new glory by, how? by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the, the third part of the Godhead that on this earth, the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away, that when I go, I will send the helper to you. He will convict the world of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. It says he'll teach us. It says he'll declare to us the things that are God's. He'll show us things to come. Oh, the Holy Spirit is our very best friend on this earth. And by the Holy Spirit, we can be transformed. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not a matter of, of just, once again, trying to will yourself into the next level of glory or just sermonize yourself into the next level of glory. Or, but ladies and gentlemen, it is by the Holy Spirit that we're transformed. How will the Holy Spirit transform us? Well, there are some common denominators for everybody by the Word of God. He will illuminate the Word of God to you. You know, it, it's amazing. If you, you, you've ever struggled to understand your Bible, if you pray a very simple prayer, Holy Spirit, I pray you guide me into all truth. I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit will begin to bring this stuff out alive to you. I, and, and this is my personal life. I don't know if this is the, the same for everybody, but it seems like it's pretty, pretty darn close if it's not. But one of the greatest ways I've found for personal transformation is through the reading of the Word of God. I, I just have found this Bible, if we put our nose in it and we read it, that this is the greatest way. It's greater than any other book we could read, greater than any sermon we can hear, greater than any conference we can go to. There's no substitute for getting into the Word of God on a regular basis. This is one of the number one transformation agents of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And he guides us into this truth. I found that church 
being around like-minded believers. You know, being a young man and trying to step away from the world and trying to step away from my past and at the age of 18 getting serious with God and you're at the peak of your, you know, all that testosterone and all that going on. And I remember one of the greatest gifts God gave me was a friend named Craig Haywood. And uh, Craig was also a, a believer with similar convictions, and we wanted to just become men of God together. And I remember praying with Craig, and, and we did everything together, just inseparable, until Andrea came along. But I will tell you this, man, I met Craig through church. And when, if you walk with the wise, you become wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. And man, when we're getting in church and we are here in the word and we're fellowshipping with like-minded believers, there is a transformation process that the Holy Spirit uses in that. Our prayer time, on our prayer time when we empty ourselves out, our time, and, and I, I can't encourage you enough to pray like they prayed in the Bible, Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, baptize me with your power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So that is just our one scripture message tonight. But man, I, I, I just encourage you. I mean, just, just practice this. Next time you look in the mirror at yourself, Remind yourself, that's not what I'm looking at. I am beholding the, not even the image of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. Wow. Can you, and, and so when we sing that song today about grace, grace, God's grace, you know, Brian, that amazing grace can take you it can take Jeff. It can even take Mike Race. And you look at this. And we don't see Brian. We don't see Jeff anymore. We don't see Mike anymore. We see the glory of Jesus. Now, now think about this. Can I have the other mirror? So... If I'm beholding the glory and Terry's beholding the glory, go ahead, hold the glory. There we go. So this is the glory and that's the glory. When we talk to each other, how should we treat each other? Like That's not just Terry. That's the reflection of the glory of Jesus. Wow. So, so when, I mean, when, when, and I know I tease people and we tease each other and those type of things. And if we weren't teasing each other, there'd be something wrong. But we have to remember that that person that we worship with, that's the very glory of Jesus, the reflection of the glory of Jesus. And we need to treat them like royalty. Wow. And it makes something called fellowship that much more sacred and holy when we recognize that that's not just Dick, it's not just Val. It's a reflection. Not even a picture, but the glory. And we find in Scripture God takes his glory very seriously. 